The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. Open your Bibles to Romans 8. I think since we've been out a bit, we'll start with verse 12, and we will read uh, through verse 27. So then, brethren, we're under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you've not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you've received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but we also but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for if we... Do not, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. As far as God's inspired and holy word, please be seated. <clears throat> 20 years ago, I was asked by my brother to preach a memorial service for my mother. It was a very difficult situation for me, not because of grief or anything like that, but because of who would be at this service. Uh, many unbelievers, my brother himself at that point, claimed to be uh, an atheist. And frankly, I was quite frightened. I knew what I needed to do. I knew what I needed to say. Uh, and I wanted God's grace to be able to do that. But I was, uh, I was greatly, greatly distressed as I was trying to pray before the service. As I was in that condition, two cars drive up to the uh, funeral home. And out of the cars step five friends who had come to stand beside me and encourage me in that time. And that was a wonderful help that God sent to me. And that's a little picture of what Paul is telling us here about the Spirit, who he says, when we are wrestling, he comes to help us as well. I've already stated before that what we have here is a, a chapter about life in the Spirit. The Spirit is throughout this chapter, as you well know, end of chapter 7, Paul is wrestling with the remnant of sin, uh, crying out in anguish, and yet coming to the declaration, there is now no condemnation. Uh, and the no condemnation is because of the work of Christ. But that promise, he said, belongs to those who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And so there's a righteousness that's fulfilled the righteous of justification as the Spirit brings us into union with Christ, but also as He brings us into union with Christ, there is the righteousness that will grow in our hearts. And He then unpacks what it means to uh, walk by the Spirit 
and not by the flesh. First showing us uh, the attitude of the flesh and the sinful nature toward God and then beginning to develop um, the role of the Spirit. He's already dealt with that in regeneration. He then says those who have the Spirit uh, are in fact uh, made spiritual, have a hope of a resurrection, uh, are by the Spirit putting to death, mortifying the remnant of sin against which we are wrestling. And by the Spirit, we have this um, introduction into God's family. God then adopts us as his children through the work of the Spirit on the basis of, uh, of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. At which point, as he discusses the privileges of our adoption, which he enumerates uh, three, uh, free access, full assurance, and final inheritance, he the realist that he is, reminds us that the final inheritance is only going to be uh, attained through suffering. And so he says in the end of verse 17, as he announced this privilege that is ours, he then says, um, if indeed we suffer with Christ, so that we may also be glorified with him. Paul then uses this occasion to... Uh, direct our attention to what he concluded with, to be glorified with him. Um, by telling us that the sufferings that we have now are nothing to be compared with the glory that is going to be revealed. Another place he says they're but momentary light afflictions in comparison to the eternal weight of glory. Uh, he expands on that then by showing us the creation itself is a model for us that there's something beyond this life in tune in store for the creation, even as it groans in the futility of, of the curse that's been placed upon it, it will come in our uh, final glorification into a glorification. And then he moves from the creation uh, to us in verse 23. Not only this, we are ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit. So here we have now the pledge, the seal, the surety of the Spirit, we too, even though we're groaning in this body along with the creation under the consequences of sin, even as Paul groaned in chapter 7, the things that I would not, those I do, the things I ought, I don't do, he says, but the Spirit is in us, stirring us up to wait for our final adoption as sons, which is the redemption of our body. Remind us then that this is the hope of glory that is in us, not some vain <coughs> hope but the absolute reality, the surety of what belongs to us. But that hope is in the distance, and we are living now. And even as we look at the hope and think about the hope, we all find ourselves in those situations where we could use some present help. And that's where Paul goes now with respect to the work of the Spirit in our text this morning, verses 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So we come to another groaning here. We've got the groaning of the creation, the groaning of the believer as he hopes, and here is the groaning of prayer, where our groanings are taken up by the Holy Spirit, in a sense made his groanings on our behalf. I want to show you here then that um, in a believer's weakness, particularly not knowing how to pray, the Spirit helps by his work of intercession. So in our weakness, particularly not knowing how to pray, the Spirit by his intercession helps us. We'll look at three things then. We'll look at the um, the need of the believer and the work of the Spirit and the result of the Spirit's work. We'll begin with the need. Uh, Paul makes the connection in verse 26, in the same way the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. Now in the same way, he's looking back to the role of the Spirit. We'll pick back up on that. But now focusing on our present weaknesses. Now, more broadly, this refers to who we are as redeemed men and women. Uh, we have physical weaknesses, mental weaknesses, emotional weaknesses, spiritual weaknesses. We have the struggles with sin. We have struggles with cold affections. And all that 
more broadly as part of the package of the weakness that we have yet in this uh, time here on earth. But I think that he particularly is focusing here on our weakness of knowing how to pray in the midst of the trials and afflictions that believers undergo in this life. For you notice he says, we do not know how to pray as we should. Now, surely you've been in that situation. Paul was on a number of occasions. Philippians chapter 1, he's wrestling. Does he pray to stay or does he pray to be taken to glory out of this Roman captivity? Later, in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 12, he um, is praying that God would take away this thorn in the flesh uh, three times, uh, not knowing really what was at work here, and yet recognizing the grace of God in his life in providing uh, for him. We're often betwixt in between. It might be a matter of a decision to make. And it seems to you that on either side, it's a great decision, a great direction to go. How do you know? What do you do? And you will groan. You will wonder. You will be um, bewildered or think even more seriously. And this came to my mind, uh, one of uh, Eileen Scipione's emails as Dr. Scipione was dying. That some people were pleading with God to heal him. Others were pleading with God to take him. And then I tried to put myself in the shoes of a wife. You don't want to lose your husband, but nor do you want to see him here in such agony and pain. Mm -hmm. And how do you pray? How, how did I pray for George in that situation? How do we pray for little Ellie Rogers? Uh, these difficult and complex situations in our weakness we often do not know exactly what to ask God. And that brings us then to the second point, and that is the help of the Spirit. So in the same way, as the Spirit has been at work in our lives from our regeneration up through this seal of our adoption and final inheritance, in the same way, He is helping our weaknesses. Now, the word help you could almost skip over it. And yet the word is a, a profound word. It's the word help with two prefixes. One that would mean to come alongside or be with. The other to stand opposite to. And thus the visual picture is you've got a heavy piece of furniture to pick up. And you can get one end. But you need someone to come alongside of you and pick up the other end. So we're not passive in this help. The same word is used in Luke uh, 10 when uh, Christ is uh, uh, at, uh, with, with Martha and Mary and uh, Mary cries out to Jesus in Luke 10, 40. Uh, Martha. Martha was distracted with all her preparations. She came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. Same word. So she wasn't saying tell her to come do the work for me. She said, have her come alongside of me and assist me. That's the word that is being used here. So you're not becoming passive in this help of the Holy Spirit. What God is telling you that as you are in the midst of the trials and wrestlings, particularly in your weakness, how to pray, and you are trying to pray, then you can have confidence that the Spirit is going to come alongside of you and lift that load that you, with which you are wrestling. And how does he do that? Well, Paul says that we don't know how to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now, this is one of the probably more controverted passages uh, in the entire New Testament. We could say that minimally what uh, Paul has in mind here is what the framers of the confession use this text for, and that is larger catechism 182. How doth the Spirit help us to pray? We not knowing what to pray for as we ought, 
The Spirit helps our infirmities by enabling us, and there's a word out of the text, infirmities, to understand both for whom and what and how prayer is to be made. And by working and quickening in our hearts, although not in all persons, nor at all times in the same measure, those apprehensions, affections, and graces which are requisite for the right performance of that duty. Now, obviously, this is part of the Spirit's helping us um, in His ministry uh, to us, uh, helping us to understand both for whom and what and how to pray, just as those illustrations that I gave you in uh, the beginning, and giving us, stirring up within us affections, faith, apprehensions as we pray. But Paul is going much further as he speaks here about this work of the Spirit, because he says the Spirit is himself interceding for us, not just helping us then to pray, but interceding for us. So uh, Murray says that Christ is the intercessor in the throne room of heaven, and the Spirit is the intercessor uh, in the theater of our hearts. So what is this? Well, we must combine the groanings too deep for words with the intercession. Now, groanings too deep for words simply means they're inarticulate. They might be sighs. They might not be uttered at all. But they're not verbalized. And we don't know how to verbalize them. Then there's another difference of opinion. Is this the Spirit's groaning or is it our groaning? On the basis of what he says in verse 27, that he who searches the hearts, God searching our hearts, I believe the primary reference here is now in my perplexity, in your perplexity, deep within, we're groaning. We don't know how to pray. We don't know what to ask for. But with deep internal sighs, perhaps coming out in uh, some type of vocal uh, expression, a longing for God's will to be done and not knowing exactly what it is or how we should pray. And so as we are in this position, and we will find ourselves in this position, um, we are groaning within, we are sighing, and what the Spirit does is He takes our groaning for what to do and in His intercession for us, prays for what we ought to be praying. Isn't that great? I think we have some little pattern of this in the Garden of Gethsemane. Here's the perfect God-man. His pure being did not want to be estranged from His Father. Let the cup be removed. But on the other hand, in his pure being, he had been given a commission by the Father. And so, how to pray? Well, he concluded, let your will be done. But you remember what the writer of Hebrews says then, it's because of his cries that he was heard. And then he was ministered to by angels. Well, I think that's probably the greatest illustration of, of what we have uh, fleshed out for us in this work of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and so the result then, see the need and the work, is in verse 27. <coughs> and he, namely God the Father, who searches the hearts, knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for saints according to the will of God. Now it's because this begins with God the searcher of the heart is why I think this is primarily our groanings picks up the idea from Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart. That's in the basis of the reality that our God knows all things. And so we are laying our hearts out open before Him. We're saying, Lord, I don't know how to pray. Spirit, take that desire of mine that is the right desire in this situation and present it to uh, the Father. The Lord searches our hearts to know then, are we praying sincerely? Are we holding back? Are we saying with the Savior, not my will, but your will be done? See, that's the key here then. If we're praying selfishly, if our groaning is coming out of all of our own self-interest and concerns, 
uh, then we're not going to expect the Spirit to intercede for us. But as the Father searches us, and He knows that, yes, with all of our sinful flaws, we've got within us <laughs> these mixed desires. And the mixed desires are all noble and good according to the Word of God. It's out of that sincerity, then, that the Spirit, who has the same mind, so to speak, as the Father, and here we see the uh, perfect um, uh, equality of the two persons. Uh, the Spirit then will, uh, knowing the mind of the Father, the Father's willingness to grant uh, one of these things or none of these things according to His holy will, He then <laughs> intercedes for us according to the will of God. So He takes those desires that we do not know how to articulate and he then presents them uh, to the Father, consistent with the will of the Father. It's fantastic, isn't it? And so we see how the Spirit uh, is aiding us, helping us in our weaknesses, and particularly how to pray by interceding for us. We are well aware, I trust, of the weaknesses. And as you will wrestle with important issues for the rest of your days. Um, this is the situation in which you'll find yourself. And what we're being told here is that um, uh, there's great aid in the work of the Spirit. Great aid. Doctrinally, one of the things I want you to see here is, and I said this before, but the more I meditate on this chapter, this, you can write almost a complete treatise on the personal work of the Holy Spirit out of this chapter. We see his deity here, having the mind of the Father. We see his relationship to the Trinity. He's the Spirit of God to the Father. He's the Spirit of the Father. He's the Spirit of the Son, the joint procession. Then we see in this chapter his work of regeneration, of indwelling, of sanctifying, of assuredness of resurrection, of putting sin to death, of granting to us a consciousness of our adoption, the freedom of prayer, the seal and down payment of the eternal hope that belongs to us. And it's praying for us. And we neglect him. Now, in a sense, you could probably say that's his fault because he doesn't talk much about himself. <laughs> he is the one who loves to point to Christ. But we have these revelations so that we will love him as much as he loves us, if that were possible. Love him, praise him, thank him, and make use of him. We must then depend upon him as he is revealed here. The great comfort and assurance then that comes to us, and I, I couple this with right back up. He comes into us as the spirit of adoption that we might cry out, Abba, Father. We've got the free access to the throne room. But you know, if we were just plopped in there by ourselves, we would be dumb. We'd be speechless. To come into the presence of the holy and triune God and to utter ourselves, we're not nearly as foolish as Job who demanded that right. But here's the Spirit who gives us the access who says, now he will also, in a sense, take us by hand as the Savior does. And the Spirit says, Father, here is one of those uh, whom uh, we have redeemed, one in whom I live. And he's betwixt in between. She, she doesn't know. She's bewildered. But she wants your will to be done. And so, Father, know in your mind, take Mr. Scipione. was there, not simply in the friends, but then in taking those internal mutterings, sometimes so conflicted, and articulating exactly what needed to be articulated. 
And that's gracious, God's gracious ministry to us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for this description. As much as all we can do is scratch the surface, Lord, we pray that you'll make us confident in this work of the Spirit and that we will boldly cling to him in our praying, that he will grant those uh, things to us in the catechism, knowing for whom, what, how to pray. Uh, give us the fervency and spirit of prayer, but, oh, God, give the spirit to us to enable us to uh, seek you in the very depth of our being, knowing that with confidence that you will do what is for your glory and our good. We ask this for Christ's sake. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, please visit gpts.edu.